So I guess um, Nasir has just written a new book called The First Rate of Madness. It's his fourth book. And it's gotten a lot of publicity. Um, and we wanted to talk about that, but talk more also about how more widely the um, the work that we both do um, intersects or doesn't. And one one particular issue is is that um, my or my original training was in history, and your original training was in psychiatry. Although you then did philosophy, you did philosophy afterwards from MPH. And then I began doing much more postdoctoral work in, uh, in, in neuropsychiatry. And so, sort of in this ironic sense that I, my interests are much more in using the neuropsychiatry to explain history and you're using the history to explain the neuropsychiatry. Mm -hmm. right? And it's a kind of odd turn of events that um, um, takes this out. And there's a joke that we always tell and history of medicine, which is a, a senior neurosurgeon comes up to us and says, you know, uh, when I retire, I would like to become a historian of medicine. And the historian of medicine says back, you know, when I retire, I'm going to be a neuropsychiatrist, mm -hmm. or a surgeon. surgeon. Yeah. And the guy looks up and says, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. He says, I know. Right? So in one of the reviews, you were accused of practicing history without a license, which yes. I guess is the the other, the rest of the story of that. Right. So, um, so how do you use history? I mean, what's, what's your, I know you're, you're driven by your interest in the Civil War, but what? Well, it's interesting that the accusation came from a novelist, so <laughs> it's not someone who's a historian himself, but I have a, a bachelor's degree in history, I think so. I have a degree in it, um, and, uh, and, uh, and graduate degrees, as you said, in philosophy and public health, and history of psychiatry, of course, has always been in a, something that's grown out of some of that, those interests. Um, you know, as a psychiatrist and an expert in mood disorders, I and many of these colleagues that I have who with similar expertise treat people with uh, bipolar disorder and depression who are very well known, very prominent, very successful politicians, businessmen, lawyers, doctors, but we can't talk about it because of confidentiality. So one reason to go into history is because this is the only way we can talk about any of this. This is publicly available information about public figures. Uh, and if you go back 50 years like I did and, and have the documentation that you need, you can do it legitimately. Um, so that's one reason I yeah, You, chose you know what's interesting as a historian of, of neuropsychiatry, when I go back and look, because I go back and use these early cases to see if I can find clues to how we can't solve current problems in, in neurology or psychiatry and see if there's something there. And, and read over the old cases. And one of the things that's really striking is, 50 years ago in, a med in medical journals, um, almost all the publications were cases. Right? And now, all the publications are really essentially statistical surveys. They're putatively evidence-based medicine, whether good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, if you want to publish about an individual patient, you essentially have to hide so much about them that that if you're using current patients, you're writing fiction. Mm -hmm. right? And so we have this odd thing where we can't talk about the best examples of what it is that we see on a regular basis. Right. We can't talk about our current patients. You either talk about historical figures or nobody. Right. Or you make somebody up. Yeah. Or you, or you, or you but you got to make sure you can't trace their zip code. Right. Right? Or anything about them. If that somebody, you know, on a journey from Mars couldn't, you know, might be able to figure out. So you can't, um, you can't talk about it. And as a result, I wonder, has our, has our understanding of psychiatry and as a result, has it been negatively affected? If, if what we have to do, if we want to talk about conditions of, um, Mania, we have to go back to get our best examples from people who've been dead for a hundred years. Well, mania is a good example where it's okay to be dead because living patients, fifty percent of the time, falsely deny their manic symptoms. So it's 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 a perception based on a lack of understanding of psychiatry to think that if you don't have a living patient, you can't make a diagnosis. 
Besides that issue, of course, we have a lot of primary sources. All the diagnoses I made in the first rate of madness were based on primary sources in every single case, uh, including not just the memoirs of others, which gives you the outside information that you need and letters and medical records, but the memoirs and letters of the historical figures themselves, usually. And um, that's like talking to the person. How do we know? I mean, you have a fuller picture about Kennedy, for instance, than anyone has so far in psychiatry, because you've got to his, use, his use of drugs that other people haven't talked about. But I, I remember when they, um, years ago, when the Freud archives were slowly published, it turned out that, that people had written volumes on Freud and, and some of the Freud's patients, but so, so many things have been left out, kept out for a long time, that we actually, it was all wrong, mm -hmm. right? I mean, even, even our notion of Freud's notion of, uh, of conversion hysteria um, turned out that these original patients didn't say anything to Freud, so they did. But this could be published because the people that control the archives kept them out. Now, I know in some of the old, older things like Lincoln, but in the Kennedy situation, is it possible to be more that there are other things being held back that are going to make a difference? In well, I think so, because his medical records have only been available in the last 10 years, and I'm the first psychiatrist to go through them. I think only a handful of physicians have looked at them. And, you know, archival research in history is a lot like research in medicine or psychiatry. You're looking for facts and facts that nobody knew before, and it's documented there right in front of you. For instance, I found that Kennedy was treated with many psychotic in the White House. This is a fact nobody in the world ever knew before. We discovered it, and it's going to be a fact till the end of time. That's a fact. And uh, so I think I'm qualified to do that kind of historical research. The interesting thing is I've talked to other historians, like Michael Feldman, who's our friend, who uh, did that uh, great biography of, of William Sherman that got me started on this project, and General Sherman. And after 100 years of Sherman being dead, and Sherman wrote lengthy memoirs, and there's been lots of letters, personal letters that people have dug up, uh, nobody was able to put it together or be willing to and say that, look, Sherman had psychotic mania. That's why he was removed from command and the headline say, said General Sherman and saying, and he had severe recurrent depression. That's why in his letters he constantly talked about killing himself. Um, Feldman was willing to do that. Most historians weren't. And it wasn't because the facts weren't there. It isn't because historical scholarship didn't allow it. Feldman is as much of a card-carrying historian as you can get. It's because in the discipline of history, they've systematically excluded psychiatry or any kind of psychiatric thinking from most of this discussion uh, in the way that, that I talk about the biology of psychiatry, for instance, not psychoanalytic thinking where there's, it has been discussed. But aren't, aren't a lot of biographies, I mean, two things. One is, I think there are a lot of biographies that do what Feldman did. For instance, there's a new biography of um, um, the guy who wrote the Mr. X article, um, George Kennan. George Kennan, yeah. Right. And it, it doesn't. It doesn't practice psychology, but it, but it in fact, it's descriptive in the same way the Feldman's book is. So someone could then read into it, and then there's the old-fashioned things that you've obviously rejected, and you say you have, which is the psycho, psychoanalytic history. Which, right. Which the is the funny thing is that all history practices psychology because all historians are making common sense psychological judgments about why historical actors did X, Y, or Z. But they're actually not trained to be able to see when those judgments might have been influenced by psychiatric illness. So in fact, the historians who are practicing without a license are the historians who are not psychiatrists like me. And I'm bringing in something here that historians have been, as many of them have told me themselves, uneducated about, unable to make judgments because of their lack of education. Well, I think in general, one could say about the humanists in general, but historians as well, yeah. is that they don't, it's not just psychiatry they don't talk about. It never occurs them to talk about, until recently, uh, epidemic disease as a factor in history or right. um, phys physiologically, right. you know, just regular disorders and what difference it makes. Or we had a president of the United States who had poliomyelitis and most of the country didn't understand what that really meant. May still not understand, but there's a great book about that by uh, Oshinsky now. But there's another another issue that about historians that um, if you were to talk to historian, if historians say there's six historians in this room right now, and you were to say that you found a fact, they would dispute that. They would say you've interpreted a document, right? Right, and and their argument is is that what history is is a series of interpretations, and that's why there's so many different books over time, because the 
the, the interpretations change, new evidence comes in, but it's actually less evidence driven than it is truly the, the notion that we have new ways of, think, of doing history. And, and in a way that's parallel to in medicine. And, yes, uh, yes. I, be, because many things that are done in medicine work, like the explanations of historians mm -hmm. are good at that time. Mm -hmm. But then, but, and, and they solve a lot of the problems. Mm -hmm. For instance, an antacid can actually control an ulcer, especially if it has antibiotic properties to it. But in fact, giving antacids for depression is not getting anything close to the root, for, um, for uh, ulcers, not going to get close to the root cause. So what we have in medicine is always a tentative intervention, and that's the strength, which is it, it's, not, it's not ideologically based, and this is now the truth of medicine. Right. Everyone understands it's tentative in a way. Medicine is sort of what you might consider postmodern, but... No, but it's, that's that's the nature of science. It's truth is corrected right, error. Right, and I think that I think that that's that's probably what historians think they're doing. Now, right. now some of them may do it. Out. I mean, you can always add in, you know, more tools, right, to do history, right. For instance, weather, right, would be. A,